afternoon and welcome to our reflective service. The topic for today's service is what does it mean to trust in Jesus? I'll begin with an opening prayer. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude and to listen to your word with eagerness, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We will now say together the collect. The words will appear on the screen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I will now read two scripture sentences. The first sentence is from John, chapter 6, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And the second sentence, John 10, verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. We will now sing together our first hymn, In Christ Alone. <laughs> Jesus, come on, 
we will now sen say together the canticle Jubilate. If you could say the words in yellow. O oh, be joyful in the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is gracious, his steadfast love is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Phil is now going to do the Bible reading, and after that, Simon will be explaining it to us. The reading is taken from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, my name's Simon, and this afternoon we'll be reflecting on the question, what does it mean to trust in Jesus? Now we'll be looking at this in two main ways. Firstly, why we should trust in Jesus, and secondly, how we then show we trust in him. The passage Phil just read for us will probably be familiar to many of you. It's the story of how Jesus and his disciples were approached by a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Sanhedrin. He comes to Jesus at night and starts to chat to him and ask him questions. The part of the conversation that John records for us starts with Nicodemus acknowledging that God must be with Jesus because of all the miracles he's been performing. But Jesus wants to push him further. After all, the miracles are not the reason why Jesus came, but instead point to who Jesus really is and why he's really come. They validate his claims and teaching. And so Jesus says that if someone is to enter the kingdom of heaven, they must be born again, to enter into a new life with Christ, born not like we were first time round, but born of water and the Spirit. But then Jesus speaks of his own destiny in verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. If you remember the story from Numbers chapter 21, the Israelites are wandering the desert having been rescued from their slavery in Egypt, but they're still not happy. They complain about God and Moses and the quality of their food and their lack of water, despite all that God's already done for them. And so God sends venomous snakes among them and many Israelites die. But when finally the people repent of their complaining, Moses has a bronze snake made and put up on a pole and tells the people that if they look up to the snake, they'll be saved. All of humanity, you and me and everyone we might meet, have rebelled against God's perfect and wise rule. That's what we call sin. And sin has just one punishment, death. And it is demanded of all who sin. But God also has the solution to our sin. Sacrifice. A life must be given in our place that we might live. For centuries, the Jewish people carried out regular sacrifices of animals to gain forgiveness for their sin. The life of the animal taking the place of the person. However, this was only a picture, an acted out foreshadowing of the perfect sacrifice that was to come. The Son of Man, Jesus, God's own Son, must be lifted up on a pole so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. The next verse, of course, is justly famous as it sums up the message of the Bible in just a few words. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God's love for us was so great that even when we were still at war with him, God sent his only son to be that perfect sacrifice on the cross, to take the punishment that we were due on himself. God poured out his wrath his anger on his son instead of on us so that we might enter into eternal life with him if we believe in Jesus. Now John does not, is not saying that we have to simply believe that Jesus exists. God sent his own son into the world leaving the glory of heaven to come to our far from glorious earth to die a death for a largely ungrateful human race. John continues in verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. All human beings stand condemned before God because we have all rebelled against him. However, once we put our trust in Jesus Christ, then our condemnation is reversed. God sent his son to save the world, to save you and me through his sacrificial death and his glorious resurrection. But we have to believe and believing in Jesus means that we have to trust what he says is true. 
And so that brings us round to the second part of this talk. What does it mean for us to trust in Jesus? Well, firstly, we don't look to anyone or anything else for our salvation. We must acknowledge that Jesus is the only way to his father. He says as much in John chapter 14 and verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. After all, if the way to the Father is opened up by Jesus taking our place in death on the cross, taking our punishment on himself, then he must be the only way to God. Why would he agree to do that, go through the pain and agony of the cross, if there was an easier way? Muhammad never did that. Buddha never did that. Gandhi never did that. None of the Sikh gurus ever did that. Not even Moses or Abraham did that. So by trusting in God in their lifetimes, they were too were ultimately putting their trust in Jesus' death, even if they didn't realise it. But that means that none of these people are the way are the way to God. Even Moses and Abraham, who were faithful to Yahweh and who might point us to Jesus by their lives, are not themselves the way to the Father. People who don't trust in Jesus' death and resurrection, whatever religion or non-religion they are, aren't going to find their way to God. And that brings us to our second point, telling people what Jesus has done for us. If you have some good news, it can be really difficult not to tell other people about it. Well, let me tell you that the gospel message, the good news about Jesus and what he's done for us is the best news there is. On the other hand, the message of sin and death that comes with not knowing Jesus is also the worst news there could possibly be. Surely it's our responsibility as Christians, those who know both the bad news and the glorious good news, to tell those who don't know. Now, there are people in this world who are particularly gifted at simply being able to explain the gospel, the good news about what Jesus has done for them. The Bible calls them evangelists. Now, you might not consider yourself especially gifted in that way, but that doesn't let you off the hook. In his first letter, the Apostle Peter writes in chapter 3 and verse 15, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. If we are truly Christians, then we should know what Jesus has done for us, why we need to be saved, what we have been saved from and how we have been saved and what it cost and what we have been saved to. If we don't know these things, then perhaps we're not actually Christians at all. And if that's something that concerns you, then speak to someone who is a Christian and ask them the reason for the hope that they have in them. And if they can't answer those questions I ask, then you can turn to the Bible, which brings us to our third point. What does it mean to trust in Jesus? It means that we want to get to know our God better. And we do that through the pages of scripture. After all, how do we know anything about Jesus at all? There are some mentions of him in history books from around the time, but not enough to build a religion out of. All that we know of his life, all that we know of his mission, all that we know of his death and resurrection come from the pages of the Bible. The whole of the book is ultimately about Jesus, from the history of God's interaction with his people, the Jews in the Old Testament, which very clearly points forward to his coming, to his birth and life and death and resurrection, and then the actions of his followers in the years after the New Testament. And this is how God has chosen to speak to us today, through the words of Scripture. That is, the 66 books that we have contained within our Bibles. The Bible is God speaking to us through his interactions with real people in history. And so if we want to know about God's unchanging character and nature, we can find it by reading the Bible. If you, don't if you don't read the Bible on a regular basis, then might I implore you to start. But don't just start at the beginning and start reading. Instead, speak to a Christian friend and ask if they can recommend a book to help with your Bible reading. 
After all, as Paul wrote to the young pastor Timothy, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And of course, reading the Bible doesn't stop at simply reading the words and admiring the skill of the author. It means taking those words on board and living them out. Be obedient to the God who loves you so much that he gave his own son to die that you might live. Believe in Jesus, trust him and finally speak to him in prayer. If you had a human friend who loved you and showed that by giving every showed that by giving everything for you, I can't imagine that you would simply ignore them. You'd be in touch on a regular basis because you'd enjoy and crave their company. And that's why someone who believes in and trusts Jesus will pray and read the Bible. If reading the Bible is about listening to and getting to know our God, then praying is the other end of the conversation. It's speaking to God, saying thank you for all that he's done, praising his greatness, asking his forgiveness for when we have failed him, asking him to build us up and give us those things we need. We can talk about how we feel and give our worries and concerns over to him. And so there we have it. We trust in Jesus because of what he has done for us. He died to take the punishment we deserve for our rebellion against God's perfect rule on himself by dying on the cross. And we show or trust by following only him, by being prepared to explain to others why we have our hope in him. And we enjoy a loving and two way relationship with him by reading our Bibles and getting to know him and respond and by responding in prayer. Well, let's do that now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can trust Jesus because of what he has done for us in dying on the cross at Calvary and rising again three days later. Help us to trust him by putting him first in our lives, by reading our Bibles and in prayer, and help us to be prepared to explain to others the reason for our hope in him. Amen. Amen. And as we reflect on what God might have been saying to us this afternoon, Phil has some reflective music for us to listen to. Thank you. 
we are now going to say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us now sing together our final hymn. King of Kings, Majesty. Let us now say together the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We hope you have enjoyed this time of worship together. The next reflective service is planned for the 24th of November at 12 o'clock. We hope you can join us.